Born in the late 1950s, the father of 15 children, Donald Phipps, more popularly known as Zeke's, reportedly loved to pose for the television cameras and boast about his power. He had ruled over Matthews Lane with an iron fist before becoming a victim of his own power. Teach them! Always make sure the message I reach them! Zeke is the younger brother of Glenford Early Bird Phipps, the renowned leader of the Matthews Lane community during the 1970s and 1980s. Early Bird is credited with the establishment of the Spangler Posse that reportedly had a strong PNP affiliation. The police believe that Zeke amassed a fortune by heading a thriving extortion racket in the business hub of downtown Kingston. The diminutive Zeke's was thrust into the national spotlight in September of 1998 during what became known as the Zeke's Riots. However, his world came crashing down in 2006 when he was found guilty and convicted for a double murder, a verdict he later challenged locally and internationally. Some six years after his conviction, on the 24th of June 2012, was the day of decision for the then 48-year-old Phipps as the United Kingdom Privy Council, in a nine-page judgment, dismissed Zeke's appeal against his conviction and life sentence. Zeke was accused by the prosecution to have murdered Rodney Farkerson, otherwise called Rodney, and Dayton Williams, otherwise called Scotchbright, both of Bayshore Park in Harborview, St. Andrew, on the 15th of April 2005. The bodies of the two men were found in a burning heap of tires near Matthews Lane in an open lot on Rose Lane around 4 a.m. Postmortem examinations later revealed that the victims had died from multiple gunshot wounds before being burnt. Shortly after the bodies were found, Zeke was detained and underwent 12 days of intense questioning from members of Operation Kingfish, spearheaded by Assistant Commissioner of Police Glenmuir Hines. Eventually, he was charged along with one Garfield Williams for the two murders. As news of Zeke's detention spread, police and military personnel moved into sections of West Kingston to ensure calm in the Matthews Lane area and neighboring communities, which had shown almost fanatic loyalty to the era leader in years gone by. Zeke, who was 49 years old at the time of his sentencing in 2006, stared blankly into space as he was humbled by the life sentence ordered by Justice Horace Marsh. The reputed Don, attired in a black suit, white shirt and a gold chain, and who once wielded sweeping authority over sections of downtown Kingston, was told he must serve 30 years before being eligible for parole. During the much publicized trial in the home circuit court, a witness testified that on the night of the 15th of April 2005, he telephoned Farkison and Phipps answered Farkison's mobile phone. Phipps told the witness that Farkison had refused to carry out orders and it was the last time that the witness was going to hear Farkison's voice. The witness said he heard Farkison saying in a low voice, Boss, boss and then the phone went dead. The witness also disclosed in a statement to the police that Zeke told him that he had engaged in a sexual act with one of the two men. The witness said when he spoke to Zeke, he said, quote, boy leave country come a town and get rich and start dissing and refuse to carry out orders, end quote. He said Zeke continued by saying, quote, Big man, you don't have a wife in a year bed. Go hug up your wife. You hear inquiring about Rodney. End quote. According to the witness, Zeke then said, quote, My dick is in Rodney's mouth. Rodney is sucking my dick. End quote. Defense lawyer K. Churchill Nita, Queen's Counsel, made an impassioned plea for Phipps to be spared a long stretch in prison. Mr. Nita emphasized that when Phipps came for a trial, he was already demonized by the press and certain influences, including foreign forces. He said many people were surprised to learn that Phipps did not have any previous convictions. 
Mr. Nita said there was evidence at the trial, which the prosecution did not challenge, that when the men were shot, they were fighting over ganja. It seems evident that, had they been upstanding citizens, they would not have found themselves in Matthews Lane, involved in something that was questionable, he said. He asked the judge to consider the evidence given by character witnesses. Norman Lawrence, who runs a meat and grocery business on Matthews Lane. Anthony Eastwood, who operates a wholesale box juice business on Luke Lane in downtown Kingston. And Samuel Mitchell, a carpenter and bar operator at 36 South Parade in downtown, spoke highly of Phipps. They all described him as helpful and kind and praised him for his ability to resolve disputes peacefully and for bringing stability to the community. When Eastwood was asked by Senior Deputy Director of Public Prosecutions, Paula Llewellyn, if Phipps was like a judge or adjudicator in the community, he said, no, no, no. He did not make a decision. He tried and worked it out between the parties. The judge in sentencing Phipps told him that whether or not Farkison and Williams were angels, the law said they were entitled to their lives. The judge said he took into account the character evidence, the mitigation plea and the fact that Phipps had no previous conviction. Justice Marsh, in referring to the evidence, said the lives of two Jamaicans were snuffed out. He said they were shot and killed. And if that was not enough, they were placed onto tires and set ablaze. There is no evidence as to what was your part in it, but the jury, having heard the evidence, believed that you were part of what happened that night in the death of those two gentlemen, the judge said. Churchill Nita evidently was disappointed enough in the sentence to blame foreign cops for Zeke's conviction and sentencing. He also said that, quote, Community leaders such as Zeke's are necessary in the inner city communities to bring order and stability, end quote. Despite the revelation during his trial that he was never convicted of any crime before, the reality is that Zeke's was no stranger to run-ins with members of the Jamaica Constabulary Force. As on the 23rd of September 1998, he was detained for questioning on suspicion of attempted murder wounding with intent and the legal possession of a firearm. The nation had a frightening look at the power Zeke's wield, as while he was being interrogated at the Central Police Station in Kingston, his supporters rioted, leaving four persons including two members of the security forces dead. No Zeke's, no peace. No Zeke's, Kingston will burn, they said. Several police officials appeared on the balcony of the station and ordered the crowd to disperse. But that only made matters worse and the demands to see Zeke's grew louder and more profane. Next up on stage was a man by the name of Victor Cummins, the elected PNP councillor of the Matthews Lane area and incidentally the half-brother of Zeke's. He too appealed for a calm but clearly nobody was listening as the anger intensified and the crowd grew larger and louder. It was not until Zeke himself appeared on the balcony of the police station and ordered his followers to return to their homes that the demonstrations ended. On the 24th of September 1998, he was pointed out during an identification parade. On the 25th of September, he was granted $250,000 bail in the gun court after being charged with illegal possession of firearm, wounding with intent and attempted murder. On the 1st of March 1999, his trial began in the Supreme Court. On the 2nd of March, Zeke was acquitted after a no-case submission was brought by his lawyer K. Churchill Nita. On the 5th of May 1999, he was charged with malicious destruction of property and two counts of assault when two men were held and beaten after they were allegedly caught extorting money in Zeke's name. On the 21st of June 1999, the case against Zeke's adjourned Sinadia when he appeared in the corporate area resident magistrate's court. In May of 2000, a cold war began between Matthews Lane and Tivoli Gardens. 
on the 19th of November 2001. Zeke's failed to attend a peace meeting between Matthews Lane and Tel Aviv. The meeting was called after war broke out between both communities, resulting in at least seven deaths. On the 1st of May 2003, Zeke's was called to the Central Kingston Police Station for a meeting about crime in downtown Kingston. On the 13th of October 2004, there was an outbreak of violence in downtown after men reportedly aligned to Zeke's clashed with men who defected from Matthews Lane a few months earlier. On the 17th of October 2004, Zeke's was detained after police raided his wholesale in Matthews Lane and found approximately $10 million and illegal contraband. On the 18th of October 2004, he was charged with illegal possession of ammunition, illegal possession of ganja and breaches of the Pharmaceutical Act. On the 25th of October 2004, he was granted $1.5 million bail. On the 12th of January 2005, his trial date was set for March. On the 17th of March 2005, he was warned after floating his bail conditions. This now is a timeline covering the period from when the two bodies were found through his arrest, trial and conviction for double murder. On April 16, 2005, the bodies of Dayton Williams and Rodney Farkison are found partially burned on Rose Lane in downtown Kingston. On the 18th of May 2005, Zeke was detained for a questioning. In connection with the bodies found, residents ran behind the armored car calling for his release. On the 27th of May 2005, he was in court for unlawful possession of $18 million found in his uptown home. He was remanded in custody. On the 1st of June 2005, he appeared in the corporate era gun court on murder charges. On the 3rd of November 2005, police were called into quell violence in downtown after supporters of his protested for his release. On the 15th of December 2005, a trial date was set for the 12th of January 2006. And on the 12th of April 2006, he was found guilty of the double murder. In 2010, Zeke had appealed the verdict locally before petitioning the Privy Council. His local appeal failed to overturn the conviction. His legal team argued that his trial was a violation of his constitutional rights and amounted to an abuse of the process of the court. According to his team, the cell site analysis obtained by prosecutors from one of the country's mobile phone providers was illegally obtained under the Interception of Communications Act of 2002. That cell site data was used by the prosecutors to show the jury Zeke's location at the time the two men were killed. The act which was passed by parliament in 2002 gives the police the authority and the power to bug the phones of persons under investigation. When Zeke and his common law wife, Yvonne Salesman, were arrested by the police, he reportedly had 18 million Jamaican dollars in his house and when added up to previously seized funds amounted to more than 24 million dollars. However, according to Phipps, the funds seized at his Avondale home was not acquired unlawfully because at the time it was seized, he was a successful entrepreneur. Phipps has received the bulk of the approximately $24 million, which the police took from him, claiming it was the proceeds of crime. Head of the Financial Investigations Division at the time, Justin Felice, said that the final of three payments would be made to Phipps shortly. The payments were in keeping with a consent judgment handed down in the Supreme Court on the 31st of July 2011, which ordered that the money be returned to Zeke's within three months. Justice Frank Williams, who delivered the judgment, also ordered that the government should not pay interest on the cash up to the date of his ruling and awarded cost to Phipps to be agreed or taxed. The money was paid to the Attorney General's department, who then paid over the money to the lawyer representing Mr. Phipps. The money, Jamaican $8.35 million, 
US $152,185, 9,020 pounds, and Canadian $3,980 was seized by the police in May of 2005. Phipps and his girlfriend were charged jointly for unlawful possession of the money but were freed after the director of public prosecutions decided not to prosecute the case. Phipps subsequently sued to have the money returned, claiming that it was unlawfully seized. Teach them! Hey yo, hello! Send the message and make it reach them. It's teach them right here, Warlord representing. Thank you for watching. Please leave a comment below. Remember to like and share the video. Don't forget to subscribe for more awesome content. Follow me on social media and check out the suggested videos on screen. This is Teach saying, until next time, walk good, my friends.